This episode is brought to you by Newton Media Group and Peter Hollins. Today is October 9th, 2023. Would you like to build your intellectual horsepower? It is possible. In Peter Holland's book, Richard Feynman's Mental Models, we discover things like Feynman's 12 Favorite Problems Framework and how to solve any area of your life, the Feynman Technique and how to comprehend extremely complex concepts, the virtues of play and imagination in problem solving, intellectual humility and getting from point A to point B, and how to spark curiosity in all of your endeavors. The scientific mindset is the key to the next level of your life, and you can open with the tips and the information Peter Hollins presents in this book, Richard Feynman's Mental Models. Today's episode is the chapter-by-chapter preview of this audiobook. Thanks for joining us today. Chapter 1 learning to see. Keep your eyes wide open. Approach everything with circumspection. Don't accept any truth without deep thought. Expose and eradicate half-truths and demagoguery. Learn to wonder at the beauty of the world around you and, above all, think about everything. Richard Feynman What do you know? How do you know the things you know? Could there be a better way to know? And how could you find it out? What don't you know? And how might you learn? Could you be wrong? And what would that look like? What is? And what faculties do you have to perceive and understand it? These are the sorts of questions that most of us seldom get around to asking. Epistemology is the field of inquiry that asks about inquiry itself and questions the limits, characteristics, and sources of our knowledge. Being able to think about how we are thinking and know more about the process of accumulating knowledge about the world requires a mindset shift all its own. Nobel Prize-winning theoretical physicist Richard Feynman is one of the best-known and most-loved scientists of our time. He was involved in the development of the atomic bomb and did pioneering work in nanotechnology, superfluidity, and quantum computing. What made Feynman so relatable, however, was his ability to popularize his work, and his many books and autobiographies captured the public imagination and earned him a legacy in the public eye as the face of intellectual rigor, scientific progress, and the powers of the rational mind. But there's not some special access to reality that is afforded to theoretical physicists alone. What made Feynman's mindset and worldview so compelling was how he thought, not what he thought. In other words, he was consistently led to ask himself about what he knew how he knew it, and how he could do better and learn more. This is precisely what this book is about. Using the inimitable Feynman as our guide and inspiration, we will peer beyond the realm of physics and engage with the underlying nature of inquiry itself and how we might become students of life in the very broadest sense. Whatever your vocation, skill set, expertise, special interest, or personal challenges, your life can be improved by learning to learn. No matter if you are primarily concerned with personal relationships, your occupation, your life path in general, or the grand overarching philosophical questions that have teased and taunted even the greatest minds, you cannot help but improve your situation by fine-tuning those intellectual faculties that have the sole job of orienting you in the universe and helping you make sense of it. Consider this fine-tuning process of kind of meta-skill that is transferable to any area of life. Learn how to observe, to synthesize information, to analyze, to create, to solve problems, to extract meaning, to ask questions and seek their answers. In other words, learning to think 
and you will master yourself and your world to whatever extent is possible for a human being. The ability to really think. And we'll Chapter 2. Live Like a Scientist Study hard what interests you the most, in the most irreverent and original manner possible. Richard Feynman Intrinsic versus Extrinsic Motivation The mindset that Feynman appeared to constantly point toward then was a kind of special blend, incorporating one, the ability to really perceive as though a new, fresh, and without preconceptions, two, a kind of playful, open-ended, joyous curiosity in the face of the unknown, three, a willingness to guess and try out one's guesses against the result of real-world experiment. Feynman was a physicist, but what made him a scientist was not the content of his thought, but the character of that thought. One could approach any knowledge-acquiring endeavor in life with the same attitude. Physics is a great-grandchild of the classical arts first described by the ancient philosophers, physicians, and naturalists. Though the material has changed over time, the spirit of inquiry, when done correctly, remains unchanged. How does one live like a scientist? Today, the size of the megacorporations running the global economy could convince us that science is the same as business, which is the same as technology. We might look at famous tech billionaires and assume that they're living some tale of heroism in which their innovations and intelligence are paving the way for the rest of humanity. Feynman would probably have disagreed very, very strongly with this. When asked if he thought his own achievements in physics deserved the Nobel Prize, his response might have surprised many. He said, I don't think so. I don't know anything about the Nobel Prize. I don't understand what it's all about or what's worth what. But if the people in the Swedish Academy decide that X, Y, or Z wins the Nobel Prize, then so be it. I won't have anything to do with the Nobel Prize. It's a pain in the... Uh, I don't like honors. I'm appreciated for the work that I did, and I've noticed that other physicists use my work. I don't need anything else. I don't think there's any sense to anything else. I don't see that it makes any point that someone in the Swedish Academy decides that this work is noble enough to receive a prize. I've already got the prize. The prize is the pleasure of finding the thing out, the kick in the discovery. The observation that other people use it, those are the real things. The honors are unreal to me. What can we conclude given this response? Well, the obvious thing is that Feynman didn't do what he did in order to win accolades, to get famous, or even to make money. He didn't do it to impress people or satisfy some deep psychological need for validation. He didn't do it to prove himself or to show off his intelligence. In fact, one almost senses that here Feynman believes that something like the Nobel Prize is rather antithetical to his aims as a scientist. So if the greatest accolade in the scientific achievement was beside the point for him, then why did he do what he did? The answer is, he had his own intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is the name for the drive to do something that comes from within a person and their own desires. It's in contrast with external motivation, which sees the reason for doing things as coming from outside the self and from other people or circumstances. Chapter 3. Separating the Wheat from the Chaff The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Richard Feynman Intellectual Humility and the Socratic Rule It's human nature to glorify those we see as masters and experts. It's what makes us laud celebrity chefs, sportsmen, and business tycoons, and also what causes us to assume that their narrow range of expertise extends to everything. Hence, when such personalities speak out on politics, say, or medicine, 
we may be tempted to put more weight into their claims than we perhaps ought to. But being intelligent, having expertise, and being recognized for that expertise, even famous for it, comes with significant downsides. The paradox of expertise is that the better we understand a particular field of inquiry, the narrower our range of perception and the less effective we are at seeing new possibilities, solutions, or our own errors. In a 2000 study by Dean Keith Simonton, over 900 operas by 59 classical composers were analyzed using seven measures of domain-relevant experience. The researchers found that the success of an opera did correlate to how much expertise the composer had, but also that there was a point at which there was too much expertise, and the operas seemed to suffer for it. Simonton and his colleagues concluded that it's not knowledge per se that hampers the success, but rather that when people reach a degree of expertise, they acquire a kind of functional fixedness that actually makes them blind to the new, the unexpected, and the truly innovative, not to mention their own faults. One way of putting the findings is to say that an enormous impediment to learning something new is the stubborn belief that you already know it. The more of an expert you are, the greater the risk of this happening. Scientist Philip E. Tetlock gathered predictions from 284 politicians and economic experts, each with an average of 12 years' experience in the field, some of them even possessing classified information, and yet about a quarter of what the experts claim to be guaranteed outcomes never happen. And 15% of outcomes they never considered possible did indeed come to pass. In fact, the greater the expertise, the more wrong the predictions. Non-experts, however, are often successful. He reasoned because they're able to see things fresh, integrate superficially contradictory ideas, and consider solutions outside of convention. Why? A clue could be in the way that some of the experts responded when confronted with their error. They dug in their heels and insisted they were right. In other words, they did not learn from their mistakes, adjust their conclusions, or remain open to learning more. Their expertise had made them less intelligent, less humble, and less curious. How to be a humble genius Einstein always maintained that he had very little idea about how the universe worked. Feynman said, I was born not knowing, and have had only a little time to change that here and there. Socrates agreed, saying, The only true knowledge is knowing that you know nothing. These sorts of attitudes don't exist. Chapter 4 building your map of the world, how to create your own mental model. One day my high school physics teacher, Mr. Bader, told me to stay after class. Feynman, he said, you talk too much, and you make too much noise. I know why. You're bored, so I'm going to give you a book. You go up there in the back, in the corner, and study this book. And when you know everything that's in this book, you can talk again. So, Every physics class, I paid no attention to what was going on with Pascal's Law or whatever they were doing. I was up in the back with this book, Advanced Calculus by Woods. Bader knew I'd studied calculus for the practical man a little bit, so he gave me the real works. It was for a junior or senior course in college. It had Fourier series, Bessel functions, determinants, elliptical functions, all kinds of wonderful stuff that I didn't know anything about. That book also showed me how to differentiate parameters under the integral sign. It's a certain operation. It turns out that's not taught very much in the universities. They don't emphasize it. But I caught on on how to use that method, and I used that one damn tool again and again. So because I was self-taught using that book, I had peculiar methods of doing integrals. The results was, when the guys at MIT or Princeton had trouble doing a certain integral, 
It was because they couldn't do it with the standard methods they had learned in school. If it was a contour integration, they would have found it. If it was a simple series expansion, they would have found it. Then I come along and try differentiating under the integral sign, and often it worked. So I got a great reputation for doing integrals, only because my box of tools was different from everybody else's, and they had tried all their tools on it before giving the problem to me. Richard Feynman, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. Scientists love models. A model is a map of reality. It's a scaled-down representation of something out there in the world. A map, for example, is itself a model of the terrain it's describing. It's not the same thing as the landscape, and has been greatly simplified, but it really helps in navigating that real landscape when you're in it. The picture you have in your head right now of what an atom looks like is not really what an atom looks like. It's a model invented by Niels Bohr. The computer simulation of evolution or the economy are both models, as are mathematical representations of certain physical phenomena. Established scientific theories come to depend on well-known conventional models that become a part of culture, but Feynman shows that each of us can also have our own mental models, i.e., perspectives and points of view. Feynman's strategy of differentiating under the integral sign was a mental model that he had in his toolbox that was missing in the toolboxes of his peers. The result was that he could sometimes solve problems they couldn't. It's not that Feynman was a super smart genius who could use the same tool better. Rather, he had another different tool. Even better, he knew when and how to switch tools to best tackle the task in front of him. This is the power of mental models and why it's so important to consciously choose the ones you're using. The Law of the Instrument Chapter 5. Putting it all together Science alone, of all the subjects, contains within itself the lesson of the danger of belief in the infallibility of the greatest teachers of the preceding generation. Richard P. Feynman The Feynman Technique in a Nutshell Beginning with curious and high-quality observation, knowing how and why to think about those observations, building your own internal mental models that bring that data together, and learning how to communicate your findings with others. All of these are aspects to a broader approach to gaining knowledge. The more you teach an idea, the deeper your understanding of it. The more deeply you understand it, the better you are at teaching it to others. Feynman was known as a proponent of this type of thinking, and, as a science educator, he was never simply teaching about the world, but about that set of intellectual tools that would best allow you to learn about the world yourself. The Feynman technique is often praised as a comprehensive way to study because it allows for deep learning. The principles were first created by Feynman himself for his own use and to simplify and organize his own endeavors. The Feynman technique for teaching, learning, and communicating is essentially a breakdown of the scientist's personal thought processes and mental models. It rests on concise language and clean, organized thoughts, and is heavily inspired by Feynman's own time as a student at Princeton. But it speaks to the quality of this tool that anyone can use it, whether they intend to win a Nobel Prize or are simply trying to solve a snag in their everyday life. What's more, the approach can theoretically be used to understand anything, whether that's physics and math, or something like history, language learning, or philosophy. The mindset and attitude we've outlined in the preceding chapters set the groundwork for the spirit in which we undertake our learning endeavors. But if our goal is to master some more formal line of study, then Feynman's method is particularly helpful. All of us arrive at any new learning opportunity with heaps of baggage from previous educational experiences. We all have our default assumptions about 
how best to go about learning something new. But if you really want to level up in this area, it's worth being willing to experiment a little and change things up, not just superficially, but in a deeper way. Chances are you've been taught certain habits by teachers and lecturers, some of which may help you learn effectively and others less so. That's why you attempt to apply Feynman's methods to studying. Some of it may feel obvious and familiar, and some of it very counterintuitive. Before you make assumptions about any of it, adopt the scientist's creed here. Try it yourself and see what happens. Let's pull everything we've explored in the previous chapters together. The technique broadly consists of just four steps. Study, teach, identify gaps, and simplify. And, well, repeat. Step one, identify your subject. Seems obvious, but you need to actually have some idea of what you're trying to learn or the problem you're trying to shine light on. Start by putting down everything you know into words. Use a notebook and pen or a laptop and write down every detail, even if it seems insignificant. In fact, be quite literal and clear. Thanks for listening to Voice Over Work and Audiobook Sampler. Where do you listen? If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, newtonmg.com, to your friends and colleagues, as well as that of today's featured author, bit.ly slash Peter Hollins. This has been a Newton Media Group production. Join us next week for the audiobook preview of a new book from Voice Over Work and Audiobook Sampler.